Hi, my name is Wolf Rebesser. When I started as a student in oceanography, I became really excited about the elemental cycles on our planet and the question what drives them. The science dealing with this is called biogeochemistry because it involves biological, geological, and chemical processes. And even though not included in the word biogeochemistry, a lot of geophysics. Together, these processes keep the elements cycling on our planet. Because the scale of this is so large and outside the normal world of perception, it is difficult for us to get a good feel for it. So let's use an analog that feels more familiar to us. Let's take the human body as an example. And let's step back in time about 100 years to the beginning of the 19th century. Physicians at that time had a fair understanding of the human blood circuit, the respiratory system, and the digestive system. And they knew which organs were responsible for keeping them going. The heart, the lungs, the stomach, the intestine but they didn't know the details of how these are linked, let alone the connections with the nervous system, the lymph system, or the hormone system. Well, this is precisely where the science of biogeochemistry stands today. We can measure the cycles of major elements on our planet, such as oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, to name a few. And we know the major organs involved in their cycling, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, meaning the oceans and freshwater, the lithosphere, the earth crust, the cryosphere, the big ice shields, and the biosphere, all life on Earth. But how the elemental cycles are interconnected and what keeps them in balance, we don't really understand yet. Let me give you an example for this. Take a look at this graph. Staying with the analog of the human body, this graph can be seen as the fever curve of our planet. The red line shows the temperature fluctuation over the past 400,000 years, reconstructed from oxygen isotopes in an ice core drilled in Antarctica. From tiny air bubbles in the same ice core, scientists have reconstructed the atmospheric CO2 concentration over the same time period. By the way, time goes from left to right, so on the very right is today. So just look at the amazing correlation between the two curves. Warm periods correlate with high CO2 values, cold periods with low CO2 concentrations. Just by looking at this graph, doesn't it make you think that the two parameters, temperature and CO2, must be closely linked? And you're right. As you probably know, CO2 is a strong greenhouse gas. So it has a direct effect on how much of the energy coming in from the sun is trapped in the atmosphere. What is also striking in this data set, in each cycle from cold to warm and back to cold, CO2 concentration stops changing at the same maximum and minimum CO2 concentration. So why not higher than 300? Why not lower than 180? What is it that keeps the CO2 in this well-defined range? The answer is, we don't know. But if we can't explain, how well do we really understand the elemental cycles on our planet? That's why, to me, this analog to medicine in the beginning of the 19th century seems quite appropriate. By the way, did you notice that the CO2 concentration increased beyond 300 parts per million at the very right end of the graph? Well, this is where humans started to interfere with the natural carbon cycle by releasing massive amounts of CO2 from burning fossil fuel. Presently, we are at 400 ppm, 100 units above the maximum during the previous four cycles. And we can take these even back further in time. If our CO2 emissions continue at this rate, atmospheric CO2 will reach levels of 600 to 800 ppm by the end of the century.
We do have a fair understanding of what this means to our climate system, but we are far from knowing how this massive perturbation of the carbon cycle will affect the biogeochemistry on Earth, and in turn, how changes in biochemistry, biogeochemistry, will feed back to the climate system. But let's come back to the elemental cycles in the ocean and take a look at some of the basics. What brings elements into the ocean and what makes them leave the ocean again? We call these processes the sinks and sources of elements in the ocean. The most important source term for the ocean is river discharge. Weathering on land breaks down rocks and soils. The freed minerals are washed out by rainfall and flushed into streams and rivers which discharge them into the ocean. The next important source process is atmospheric deposition. Particles are carried by winds from land to sea and deposited there. A small contribution also comes from hydrothermal vents. Here, seawater is leaking into rich systems, gets heated up underground, and is expelled back into the ocean, much like a coffee maker. The heated water dissolves various compounds from the Earth's crust and releases them into the ocean's bottom waters. So with a continuous supply by these processes, does the load of elements in the ocean steadily increase? No, because there's also a continuous loss of elements from the ocean. The most important loss process is sedimentation. Particles sink to the deep sea floor and accumulate there. Over old ocean floor, these accumulations can measure up to several hundreds of meters in thickness. Another loss process is outgassing of compounds from the ocean into the atmosphere. And the third, probably least important sink, is hydrothermal vents. Again, the reason that they also act on the loss side is that some compounds dissolved in seawater precipitate when the water is heated up. So they are deposited underground in the rich system. So now that we know how elements come in and go out of the ocean, let's take a look at what determines their distribution in the ocean. Basically, we can classify all elements into three categories. They can be conservative elements, particle reactive elements, or bioactive elements. Let's start with the conservative elements. They do not easily react with other elements, so once dissolved in seawater, they stay dissolved. Their distribution is almost homogeneous throughout the water column. Sodium and chloride, which make the ocean taste salty, belong in this group, along with many other elements. Then there are particle reactive elements. They easily absorb the particles and are transported downwards as the particles sink. They have somewhat reduced concentrations in the surface ocean, where the concentration of particles is highest. The elements most depleted in the surface ocean are bioreactive elements. These are the elements that organisms need to grow. Carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus, silica, and a few others fall into this category. For some of these elements, surface layer concentrations are close to detection limit in some parts of the ocean. Because of this, biological productivity in these areas is very low. In biogeochemistry, we're of course most interested in these bioreactive elements as these set the limits for biological productivity in the ocean. But we will come to that in a later chapter. By the way, did you notice the difference in the vertical profiles of the particle and bioreactive elements between the Atlantic and the Pacific? Do you have any idea what could be the reasons for this? Well, that's for you to figure out. This chapter is intended to set the stage for our lectures on ocean biogeochemistry. A key message from this chapter is that the elemental cycles in the ocean are all interlinked, just like the different circuits and systems in the human body. But in ocean biogeochemistry, we are still at an early stage in understanding all those linkages, much like physicians in the beginning of the 19th century. But there is a major difference between the science of medicine and biogeochemistry. Medical research has countless patients to work with, 
And if things go terribly wrong, there's always a chance to do better with the next patient showing similar symptoms. But there's only one planet Earth, and we're in the midst of a global experiment with unknown outcome. How much risk can we afford to take?